What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Sisterhood of the Traveling Plants. I'm the Dizzy Grower. I'm here with uh, Puff and Pixie and Miss Ruby Doobie today. We're going to hang out and talk about soil life and get laid. So, yeah. it's, uh, 710, let's drop a dab. I always forget that cat's name. Buddy Guy. Buddy. buddy guy. He's my buddy guy. See, he's, he's, not Cana guy. he's not Canadian, is he? <laughs> he's Russian. <laughs> well, that's close enough. <laughs> always, he looks always. like he wants a dad. He's looking at the rig like, hello, you know, what yeah. about... Really nice. She gets all pissed yeah. off. She gives me a dirty look if I blow smoke in her face. She's like, oh, fuck you, and walks off. But he likes it. <laughs> Hi to our chat tonight. I hope everybody's doing good out there. I see a lot of our friends. We've got Medgiver, Nana, Holy Smokes. I uh, saw Robert White in the uh, chat earlier. Lit T's in there. I heard she went and stopped by and visited you this week, Miss Ruby. And you guys had a good yeah. visit together, huh? Had a great visit. <laughs> yeah, it was one of those ones that actually went on longer than what she expected it to, so it was that good. <laughs> That's nice. I'm glad you two got to meet up and actually make the face-to-face -face connection. That's always fun. Yeah. Hi to Canna Trooper and Poops420. Poops, you gonna make me laugh tonight? Ah, probably. <laughs> How are you doing tonight, Miss Puff and Pixie? I am awake. Mm -hmm. well, that's Thankfully. Good. Well, you know, I mean, I've been I've, I've been having trouble sleeping, so being awake is an event in and of itself. But I'm very awake tonight because I had a little bit of coffee at like three thirty, and I try not to drink coffee unless I'm going to burn that energy. But tonight, I figured I had a good excuse. And the excuse was to get blaze, which will make me tired because I'll be smoking an indica. So. <laughs> I need that caffeine counteraction. Huh? One plus 17 <laughs> equals four. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I feel you. I had a big cup of coffee right before the show, too, because I was, well, I took a nap before the show. I was like, I got to set my alarm, get up, have coffee. <laughs> but I missed you having on this uh, CK critical kush flower rosin all day today and it is a heavy hitter it's so good but it's definitely an indica knocks you down <laughs> we've been um we've been sampling the uh, the plants that we're harvesting and we're discovering that um let's see what was it the the uh warm cookies and space dude uh Laughy, giggly, up, sort of uh, uh, high, and the um, the kosher kush and time wreck are are more of the bedtime strain. So, <laughs> but definitely been sleeping really good since we've been harvesting. So that's awesome. I always loved that you know first tries of a new harvest. It's always like, oh, okay, what's it going to be like? Which one's going to be my favorite? And, Especially when it's a bunch of new strains that you haven't grown before. It's like totally surprise. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And it smells so good around here. <laughs> yeah. I'm finally almost done with trim jail. Oh my lord. How long have I been in trim jail now? Fuck. Not, like, it feels <laughs> like months. It's more like prison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think we started the last week of September, which would I mean, this is like week five or six now. Oh my, oh my gosh. Yeah. I spent uh -oh. let's see, 12 hours on it on Saturday, like eight hours on it yesterday. Today I peaked out after about six hours. My neck and shoulders were so tight and I had a headache. I was like, okay, I just can't do it anymore today. But I'm on the last strain, so we're almost there. It's got to be a relief. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I think you're when you're done. You know? The the nicest thing about going through that is that you know you're gonna have such a reward when you get it all done. You know? Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, it's just like, I wish I could kind of spread it out, but I know if I want to get everything cured nicely, I need to just get it done, you know? <laughs> so, so I'm like pushing myself so hard to get it finished because I just want it to be really good. So can't wait till it gets like way too dry. In the jar it goes. <laughs> Um, was asked about Mike. Um, he actually had some advice today from somebody about um, a yoga posture that he tried that um, gave him a little bit of relief. So we're going to keep on doing some more yoga. I guess I'm going to have to be his trainer and all that kind of stuff. So the Go, Ruby. <laughs> You're going to get a leotard too? Please don't. <laughs> That'd be so 80s. <laughs> That no video. Awesome. <laughs> With leg warmers. And, and, oh, yeah. And leg leg warmers. Warmers. Oh, my gosh. I can get those. some for you. <laughs> yeah, and you have to wear bright red lipstick when you exercise. That's a bad memory. <laughs> and, and blue eyeshadow. Blue eyeshadow. Now I'm seeing the, the exercisers on, on cable TV. Oh, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, leotards. I remember going to actual pastel colors and then the the leg warmers. I remember going to jazzercise class with my mom when I was like maybe eight or so, and all the ladies had their little mats and their little leotards. <laughs> it was so fun. <laughs> I'm crying over here. <laughs> Jazz oh, Jane Fonda tapes, lit he called it. Yeah. Yep. So. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was the, the <laughs> Excuse me. people that the guys watched just to watch it because, yeah. <laughs> you know. I remember so maybe I'll get him having this one on PBS. Stuff. It had this lady. I don't remember what her name was, but it was on at like 6 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I remember getting up and doing exercises with that thing. <laughs> oh, man. <sighs> curious farmers, curious why Pixie doesn't show her face. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I'm I'm not exactly in a <clears throat> legal state, and um, I have a lot of people here who know me, and well, I'm I'm fairly I'm fairly well known because I'm very charismatic, and that's a problem when a lot of people know you because if you put your face out there, then they see you, and they're like. She smokes cannabis, and it's, like, really controversial, man. So, like, yeah, it's, it's live free or die here, and I like being free. So I'm all about the not dying in prison. <laughs> I feel you there. <laughs> Plus, you know, it's just, like, so different when you're in one of the states where it's not legal still because you have that, like, that judginess like people are getting over that here in Colorado like at first they still were really judgy now there's still some that are but like less and less people are judgy about it now <laughs> it's almost like flashbacks when I talk to people that are still in states where it's not legal like yeah, oh, yeah it used to be like that <laughs> yeah. and as when we were in Oregon it was um, really accepted there by most people although there were some bank people who were really snooty about it. Um, I remember one person getting their account closed because of how they smelled. And the account that they had closed didn't have anything to do with cannabis. It was just personal, but yeah, yeah, so it can happen. But yeah, but yeah more people are seem to be really accepting here in Arizona too, so. Yeah, that's, that's what's interesting is I'm, I'm actually surrounded by states that are legal and I'm about to be underneath a country that is legal well supposedly supposedly it's, it's it's legal but as as poops 420 said not really <laughs> so it's, it's, it's legal it's, as long as you work for the government is it going to take the rest of the world like making it legal again for us to get our shit together here <laughs> well i think it's really funny that you know i live in the live free or die state <laughs> right okay we, I know. Yeah, the West, you here. know, and and the the rednecks and the banjo players and the psychos to the south, uh, 
are all legal. <laughs> oh, and, and we got the killers too to the southwest. Okay, so you know, I mean, we're we're literally surrounded. By all these other people who are so, like, uptight and, and, like, follow the rules, follow the rules, follow the rules. And they're all like, cannabis, woohoo! And it's like, it's like, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> you know? Cause, because, I mean, that should be here. This should be happening right here. This state, these people who are like, live for your die, man. And these people... When you feel like you're the only one and you don't really want to be the face. <laughs> well, exactly. And these people who live in this state who are like so die hard, live free or die, they're just sitting there. And the minute you say the word cannabis, they're like, <gasps> and it's like, are you feeling okay? Oh, I'm sorry. Are you related to somebody who's connected to somebody else who knows somebody in the cartel or, you know, are you a mule? Because, you know, we're the number one state for, for the opioid crisis. Yeah, yeah, that heroin and uh, the fentanyl, that's us. So, it's like, hi, how you doing? Yeah, no. We, you know, cannabis? 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 What is that? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, do you mean the marijuana? Oh, that weed? That terrible weed that takes over all of our gardens? Well, it yeah. should take over your gardens. It should be your garden, damn it. You'd be healthier. <laughs> and then we have the people here who took a half million dollars from the fentanyl makers to yep. defeat the cannabis uh, recreational measure. And, um, and our attorney general is suing the fentanyl makers and to make them give back profits we should make them give back the five hundred thousand but um I you know it, it's just so it's so infuriating. Yes it it's just I, it, <laughs> <laughs> it does it, it just it kind of gets my gets my dander up. There we go. <laughs> It's hard enough to fight the stigma, and then you have groups that are actively opposing uh, legalization, and they use lies and, you know, um, the same falsehoods and nonsense that they've been using for, you know, the whole, the, the same fear tactics and other things like that that they've been using for a million years, or, well, not quite that many more like 50. <laughs> but, uh, it's just weed, man. <laughs> so, I, I can't believe after all this time that everybody else in the entire country seems to have all this information about cannabis and nobody in Washington has access to this information. Why is there, is there some sort of like blockage between the internet like cannabis information in Washington or something and and like the state legislatures and something maybe it's like a force field or something like that <laughs> they probably just need to smoke some cannabis it's a wall they built a wall a wall <laughs> yeah a wall of ignorance <laughs> Damn it. Well, to counteract some of that ignorance. <laughs> we should all <laughs> we are here. talk about what we have been trying to learn about. Um, you know, just we are not experts. We are not like scientists. We are learners <laughs> in this room. <laughs> so we're we can, playing uh, in the dirt. <laughs> We are, we are playing in dirt, and we want to know more how to make our dirt work better. So <laughs> we've been yeah. uh, learning a little bit about soil biology and all of the little uh, bugs and things that live in the soil and help make it better for our plants and um, create this wonderful symbiotic relationship with our plants to make them as healthy as they could possibly be. So 
you know, we definitely don't really know what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know we're what we're talking stuff. about. We just don't understand all of it. <laughs> we're just trying to figure it out. So this is more like a discussion than anything. So please yeah, contribute <laughs> in the chat. If you know some stuff, like clue us in and we'll, we'll try to figure some shit out. That's right. Everybody so just been... got upgraded to panelists. <laughs> That's right. Like, how, let's, let's talk about right. soil. Yeah. So, um, because because we said we said before we left the last time that we were going to talk about soil mycology, and because uh, I was really interested in um, what had sparked it was somebody had posted a picture. Um, I forget who it was, but it, it was just in my feed you know, people you might like or photos you might like. And it was a picture of mushrooms on uh, the soil. And the person was asking whether or not these mushrooms were bad for their plant. And, and then the next picture in the slideshow that they had was they had picked them all. And <laughs> I, I just, I was aghast. <laughs> you know? I, I was aghast because I said, well, but you didn't even give us a chance to answer the question. Why? <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I wanted to learn a little bit more. And the more I started digging into things, the more I, digging into things, um, the more I started to realize that, you know, dirt is more than just, as my, my four and a half year old uh, nephew reminds me, gross. <laughs> It's gross in a really beautiful way because if you look at the finer things in the dirt, that's when you start to get to a point of appreciation because it becomes less of something that is there to be washed off and more of something that is there to be rinsed gently from and saved. You know, the same way that you would, you know, go ahead and scrape the last of the batter off of your hands back into the bowl. You wouldn't want to lose any of it because you're going to use that. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not a part of the bowl and it's not a foreign substance. It's something that you're going to use. So absolutely every grain, every, just, oh, everything in there. And it, it, it's already. precious. Sure like, don't, <laughs> don't, 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 don't spill it. Don't leave it. It's terrible. So, Take it. yeah, Fuck. don't, don't <laughs> kill them. Like, it's like my friend Tara in the bag, you know, like scraping her topsoil, man. I can't take it. <laughs> it's like, don't, why? Well, it's growing mold. No, no, no. It, it, was, it was growing life. <laughs> and so, um, because that life that you're seeing grow on your topsoil, and a lot of people might not know that. I mean, even if it's not mushrooms, even if it, it looks like, um, you know, like mold or like fuzz, and you think, oh, no, it's PM or, oh, no, but it's too early for PM. It's too, you know, the conditions aren't right. I mean, do the math actually do the math and take a look and and say to yourself okay before you go ahead and head into a knee jerk reaction you know and say it's mold think about what you're about to do because it's not necessarily mold and even all mold is not bad okay because mold does in fact produce um and and feed fungus so there may be a purpose for that spot of mold that is right there it you know to feed another fungus because different fungi eat different things so that being said i wanted to know how to sustain my my mycelium and because i realized that the more nematodes i had the more fungus would be controlled. But the fungus also eat nematodes. So that would control that population. I needed something that would eat and produce both to balance the equation. Well, that's an earthworm. So if you have your mushrooms or mycelium, your fungi, I, you know what? 
I'm going to go ahead and slip this in there. Why are there only fun guys and no fun girls? I want to know that. <laughs> there must be a... Girls just want to have fun. <laughs> <laughs> I had to say something. <laughs> oh, girls just want to have fun. I'm a fun guy. <laughs> I'm a fun girl. What's interesting is, uh, um, I remember the soil that we made back in Ohio all those many years ago. And um, this was, I guess, probably the early 80s. It was prior to the internet. But there was already the, what was called the free net. The free net usually was something that you could get onto and you could go to a university or college library and they had documents you could access, but there wasn't, there weren't websites and things like that. But there were uh, places where people up could upload documents. And so one of the ones that Mike came across was the Ed Rosenthal recipe for soil. So we built a great big pile of soil in our basement. And, oh, my gosh, it smelled good enough to eat. Um, peat moss and all kinds of different additives to it. And... Um, I think he fertilized with fish during the grow. And I know that we used CO2 because we had a really nice tank set up with tubes and stuff. But um, I couldn't honestly remember if there was mycelium growing on the soil, but I do know that we didn't have any problem with um, any kind of uh, unwanted fungus or mold. We didn't have we didn't have PM issues. We didn't have um, and we also didn't have gnats or other bugs, uh, any kind of issues like that the whole time that we grew with that soil. So um, I wonder we did use some some worms in it too. And so it sounds to me like we just happened to put everything in there that we needed to for it to grow what it needed to grow to be healthy healthy soil so it's good that, to know that you can do that because that's what i know people have been wondering about it uh i know people have asked before about growing your own nematodes and things like that um there's different ways of fermenting things and making fungus and go on with your narrative mm -hmm. please. <laughs> <laughs> okay so um, what, what I had found was I needed a way to um, maintain the mycelium because if, if you just let them grow, they release their spores and then, you know, they decay, they return to the soil, um, you can run into some serious problems uh, because the, if the fungus begins to dominate your soil and floods it with all of its nutrients well i mean just like any other nutrient if you give your plant too much nitrogen or you know too much magnesium or m or you know if you give it too much of anything it'll lock it out and then it'll go into a deficiency you know so there has to be a balance across the board so i needed something that would eat the mycelium but that would also feed the mycelium so I went ahead and looked that up, and my answer was nematodes. Well, at first, nematodes, okay, it's kind of cool. I can dig it. There's stuff crawling in my dirt, everywhere in my dirt, everywhere in that compost pile. There are things moving, man, that you cannot see unless you have Okay, eBay, $30, you can get a 1,000X um, uh, microscope, very powerful bright light, and it is portable. So you, your friends and family, what is going on inside of your compost pile? Beware and be warned. <laughs> because 
<laughs> you will never look at a pile of dirt the same. <laughs> and like it's going to come alive. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> so, so, <young. laughs> so I was like, I was like, okay, that's a little too much, too much. <laughs> so I was like, there's got to be an easier way. And in in the course of my of my musings, I went ahead and I found a do-it-yourself guide to growing your own and keeping your own. So breeding and keeping your own nematodes. And I was like, really? This can be done? There's a clean way to do this. There's actually an anaerobic way to do this. So I'm in the process of trying that out. I haven't completely finished it yet because I'm kind of curious about a couple of things. I want to know if certain environmental things are affecting things because you're using a petri dish. I mean, that that right there ought to tell you something. So you're in an anaerobic environment. So what but, exactly are you doing? Like, how, how are you how are you doing it? Because I'm, <laughs> I'm confused and excited. <laughs> Well, um, I went ahead and I got the wax hardware store up the street. That is also our bait and tackle shop. What did you get? What did you get um, there? Wax okay. one. Yeah. So all you need is like some basic larva. Um, I got wax worms because they were the ones that were recommended, and they're pretty hardy and fairly common around here. And so I went ahead and I put those in a petri dish. And it's it's about it's about letting them die, you know. So the way the way I'm getting my um, my my nephews on board here is you get to kill something. But I used um, a two and a three point five inch. I needed two petri dishes, and I used a little bit of filter paper. I think it was a hundred and twenty micron. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. Um, I got about five uh, melanella waxworms from the Ace Hardware, and I used deionized water. Um, you could boil tap water, I guess, but that has fluoride in it and potentially chlorine, and so I I would recommend you know finding some deionized water. Um, and you need an aquarium with a bubbler or an air stone. Uh, I mean, a five-gallon bucket with a cover and an air stone in it will work. You just have to make sure that that bucket is clean. Um, and you'll also need a microscope. And you can do this with a really cheap microscope because nematodes are not super, 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 super tiny. Um, they're tinier than you can see in the palm of your hand, but they're not invisible. <laughs> tiny so um but yeah you know i mean and you can keep them presumably in that in that bucket or that aquarium um, i imagine an aquarium would probably be a better space although i don't think so because you have to protect it from light um so maybe not i'm, I'm trying both because i'm i'm questioning it myself and um and so you can Grow your own nematodes from from the dead waxworms. If you put the dead waxworms, once they turn black and they start to decay and like obviously break down, then you open up that Petri dish and you put it inside of the larger Petri dish and you put some water in the larger Petri dish and you put the cover on that. And then the nematodes, they team up and they produce like crazy off of the waxworms and they swim into the water. And then, you know, after a few days, and you can usually observe that underneath the microscope. I haven't been able to do that because my microscope is not here till Thursday. So I might have to start my investigation all over again because by then I don't know if my nematodes will be dead or if they'll still be alive because presumably they live for 30 days. Um, but you can have a bucket full of nematodes. And um, what I found to be very interesting about these nematodes and why I went into this whole experiment is that 
the nematodes actually balance the soil in the sense that they prevent PM. Um, and it's it, because they bring balance across the board. So they prevent PM, they reduce your fungus gnats because the nematodes are eating the, the dying fungi. And so, and, and your spider mites also have nowhere, have, have nothing to live off of because you're balancing your soil. So if you have nematodes in your soil, you have mycelium, mycelium growing on your soil, and you have some worms crawling in there, and you can have worms in your indoor soil. Don't give me any excuses. I want to see Frank in every single garden in this community. So, that being said. So, I had a question. Yeah. Um, so, you were saying that the, the nematodes eat the mycelium? Mm-hmm. And the mycelium eat eats the nematodes. The nematodes. Mm -hmm. So that just sort of keeps them in balance. Then, if you have the right environment, right. So if you can if you can dial that in, because we're already running an anaerobic environment in an indoor grow, you're already running an anaerobic environment. So you have the perfect conditions to control the level of growth of your mycelium and the amount of nematodes in your soil because your soil is not in the ground. Your soil is in a pot. You control that soil. The earth doesn't. So whatever you're putting into that soil is what the plant is getting, which stands to reason, you know, if, you, if one plant gets attacked by PM, okay, and you walk out, you know, and you don't notice. You notice maybe a spot. You say, oh, that, I don't know. I'm going to pick that off. And you go inside for the night. The next morning you come out and you got three girls covered in the stuff. You know, obviously there's a drastic imbalance. And those imbalances begin in the soil, just like the plant begins in the soil. So that imbalance has to be there. Right, right. Well, and then, you know, I mean, of course, you have to look at your environment as far as your humidity and your air circulation and mm -hmm. all that. And all the way through drying. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so because we're able to dial all of those things in and we seem to have a, a pretty good beat on knowing, okay, well, let's keep our humidity here and let's keep our airflow here. And this is, you know, the optimal temperature range. And we want this much, you know, um, we want this much oxygen. We want this much carbon dioxide, you know. So, when when you when you start dealing when you start running such a controlled environment you you look at some of these people and they've got freaking clean rooms you know going with plants in them yeah now, I've seen people that were that the, the problem with that is that that genetic is going to become extremely unstable because the minute you bring that genetic outside it's going to be attacked by absolutely everything, and it's not used to that. You've been growing it inside, clone after clone after clone after clone after clone after clone, you know, for how many generations? You know, you know well, we can't grow outside here, but, you know, we, we, we've talked about it, and even if we could, just because of the fact that there are so many variables in the outdoor environment. We prefer to grow indoors anyway. So even if we could grow outdoors, we would prefer, um, well, we would probably use a greenhouse, you know. Yeah. But um, then to control the environment. And, you know, I mean, so, there, there, welcome back. But, you know, I mean, plants are susceptible on different levels, too. You know, I mean, if, for instance, you know, if, for instance, you have um, 
mildew heading, you know, powdery mildew heading into your garden because it's the end of the season. It's been unusually humid and it's been cold at night and warm during the day. You have the perfect conditions for, you know, that powdery mildew to bloom. You know? worse, no, root rot. Well, right. So you have that blowing towards the greenhouse, you know, and it's being carried on the air. Well, I'm not saying that the spores won't go through the greenhouse. Yeah, you know, the plant may encounter powdery mildew, but because of the nematodes and the balance that it has in the soil, it's able to reach down and use those resources to say, uh, yeah, you, sorry, buddy, you're going to have to go somewhere else because I don't have time for you. It's like giving it a shot. It's yeah. like having a healthy immune system. Yeah. Yeah, you know, like actually giving them an immune booster to make sure that they're already, they're inoculated. You don't have to inject them with the virus. You have to inject them with the antivirus, you know. Well, I, you know, I still think it, that it's a lot like our own immune systems and our own bodies, um, we have to have a balance between the bacteria and, and the fungus. For us, it's, it's yeast. And um, we must need it, a certain amount of it. But it um, depends on how healthy we keep our environment as to whether we can ward off diseases and things like that. And there are immune boosters that we use for ourselves as well. Interesting. It's interesting to me how... Um, how much parallel there is between a healthy diet for a plant and a healthy diet for human beings. Yeah. We, and we eat, so. Well, and we're all, and absolutely everything having to do with, with the plant and taking care of it from the start of the seed to cutting it down, is built on something else. You know, I mean, we go ahead and we build lights and we build air filters and we build cabinets and we build tents and we build grow rooms, you know, we build plants and we build our house, you know, so why not? Yeah, I mean, you should build from the ground up, right? Does anybody ever build from the top down? Oh, I totally agree. Um, you should build your soil to begin with. Yeah, you know, because, I mean, it, it, it's no good once you get to that bloom and you can't spray for anything. And, you know, so if you're attacked by spider mites or you're, you know, um, plagued by fungus gnats, guess what? You know, it's still going to happen. So, yeah. It's like, all right, well, let's find a way to balance it. Let's just ask the question and get some answers because I'm very interested to try these nematodes in my soil and see if the plants that I grow suffer less, you know, because I just wonder. I wonder because I know that I have strains that are um, susceptible to certain things and it's like, all right, well, I know that that is extremely weak when it comes to powdery mildew resistance. So if any spore comes within any range of head, I'm pretty sure it's going to catch something. It's like catching a cold, you know. And it's another sense. I wouldn't expect a guy to understand it, Poops 420. It's a mom thing, right? Ruby, you always know when your kid is getting sick. Right. <laughs> He does understand the, the concept of a healthy plant resisting PM. But and but it's true that um some strains some people are more susceptible to certain diseases and things than others and some plants are more susceptible to certain diseases and and uh, probably um pests than others. So but I would suppose that I mean in my mind it's always been um for me the idea was to recreate the outdoor environment, at least the the most beneficial parts of it in the indoor grow for whatever strain I'm growing. And I'm glad that people are starting to track more about what they're doing with the different strains and how they grow because different strains apparently don't need 
all need the same environment. So, well, which makes sense because this plant grows all over the world, always has. So, um, it's grown in different environments, and I would imagine that's one of the ways that the different strains has developed. So, good to find out the tracker program that, the, that Mrs. T has going. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm apologizing to Northwest Jay. I'm, I'm sure you made a wonderful mother. <laughs> you know, something I've learned <laughs> over the last few months is that you can't tell by someone's name in chat <laughs> whether they're female or male. So. I don't make that assumption anymore. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know what? Because, because my 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 sister's name is. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things. It's like, all right, well, you know, when somebody says their name is Riley, I'm like, great. I have no idea what to expect. <laughs> I, I like my friends. This is funny, but even lit tea. I wasn't sure when when I first saw that T in the chat if that was a guy or, or a girl. So now I know. <laughs> well, well, yeah, like party and piglet. I don't know. Well, and then on IG she's Ms. Lit T, so that clued me in. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you got to know things. <laughs> right. <laughs> Speaking of knowing things, I know that my pipe is packed. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, mine is too. Come to, come to. That, that, that's one of those things that I know. You know what? That's very coincidental. I like coincidences. My pipe is not packed, but I packed there it. There you go. lines. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. You're ready to go. Well, while everybody's like um, doing their bowl and their dab or their whatever, I, ha I have a question. I have a question for chat. Um, this came up yesterday that while I was making pancakes for Fada Mike for breakfast, and I got to wondering why it is that it's okay to eat cake for breakfast as long as you make it on a pan. <laughs> kind of oxymoron, isn't it? It is full of sugar. It got any <laughs> theories on that? <laughs> got all the same stuff in it. Hmm. Well, I, I just I just got I I just missed the whole question. Every time you go to say something really interesting, I missed the whole question because it chops you off. And I think oh. it's the internet hating me. <laughs> I hate the internet sometimes. <laughs> okay, so so why is it okay? To eat cake for breakfast, as long as you make it on a pan, and call it pancakes. But you can't eat cake that you bake in the oven for breakfast. Unless it's Why coffee cake. That? Right, oh. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I proved that, I, I proved that wrong. You know, I, I intentionally bake cakes for my kids and feed them to them for breakfast. Like I decorate breakfast cakes and make muffins into cakes. See, I, I should have known. And actually in the back of my mind, I kind of knew that that's the kind of answer you were going to come up with. <laughs> so I make sure my kids don't just eat all or a dish. Okay. Cause if we're from the north, we call it we call it a baking dish. It's not a pan. It's a baking dish because it's stoneware or it's glass, not typically metal. We don't like to cook in the metal up here. Okay, here's another question for you. <laughs> they called cookies when we bake them in the oven. Why aren't they called bakies? Because they were meant to be eaten as batter. I, I already answered that when I was 16 years old, and my mother was like, no, they're meant to be baked. And I was like, then why are they called cookies? Because you cooked them just now. 
when, when you did all of the mixing and everything, because that's what you do at the stove. You know, when you make a pot of sauce, you mix it. All right. You're mixing a bunch of ingredients together and it's bubbling on the stove. You know, it sounds like child logic to me. <laughs> oh, it was perfect. I got I got a good size bowl of dough. Child logic there, buddy. <laughs> Work it for me. I got the dough. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> I'm, I'm still stumped about the fun guy and the fun girls, you know. I mean, because technically, if you, st if you spell out fun girl and you spell out fun guy, we have more in common with, you know, the mycelium than they do. So I want to know what's up. <laughs> right. They, they started naming hurricanes after guys. Why can't we have fun girls? <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that a rule? Does, do they have to go girl, boy, girl, boy? And, you know, in this current unified society that we live in, shouldn't we break free of the gender roles? Do, don't you think it would be nice that the next um, sort of like fun, fungus that was discovered was named a fun girl instead of a fun guy? I think that would be great. You know, discovery of new fun girl. What? Yeah. <laughs> see, people would think it was a typo. <laughs> it's like, no, we meant it. You, so you said fungi, you are, uh, you said fungi are RL. That's, that's what you said, right? Did you mean URL? I mean, like, what are we talking about? A web address here? You know, like what, what, what is, what is going on here? <laughs> no, it's not fun girl, G-U-R-L. Oh no, she went away. She must have pushed the wrong button. Aww. <laughs> Shit. No, you, you have to pronounce that fun girl. <laughs> you put a U in there. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I hope she comes back right away. I bet she will. Man. I had to stop smoking my joint and be <sighs> bad. <sighs> oh. Yeah, I just had this bowl of, um, I, I believe this one is the Coach to Coach time in the time wreck. Mm. Oh. I have some seeds here. I can't wait to try them. Mm. Yeah, they're very, they're very tasty, and all of them are really frosty. So, tricks on tricks. Yeah, shit. I'm finding that a lot of the uh, Northwest genetics seem to be really just frosty, frosty. I uh, love that Smurfzilla. I think that one's going to stick around in our garden for a while. Yeah, yeah. I can't wait for the red, the red pill to be, uh, to be ready. It's the sativa dominant plant, and uh, that that one's just like it looks like sugar all over it. So uh, yeah, I'm kind so of bummed out on my. Um, what happened? My Dairy Queen and my Mayhem Bear. My Dairy Queen popped, but it didn't spread tail med put her in soil anyway hoping she would spread a tail so we had a funeral and the mayhem bear ne never made it out of never made it out of the drawer so never popped so I'm like hmm okay well I don't know <laughs> <laughs> I, I was sad that um, we're giving away a bunch of the HSO seeds that, that were sent to us, but we have so many other strains of seeds that people have sent that um, we weren't going to get to them for a while anyway. So, because uh, uh, we have we have some other TGA genetics, I, I don't even know what the strains are right now. But um, and then also uh, a couple of people have sent us testers, including Tony. And Galactic Gardens, so um, it should be interesting to see what pops up next. Although we have, we're, we're deciding right now what we're going to do cuttings of. So, we'll be to, uh, taking pictures, by the way, of our um, our finished buds, and I will post them. I'll post them on Instagram, and they'll be sugary. 
very cool. We're just about to harvest our indoor too. We've got a couple of dark plasmas, a couple of Smurfs in there, a Malibu pie that looks super chunky and colorful. Man, she's pretty this time around. So I'm pretty excited about that. And then I've got some grapefruit glue and uh, swashbuckler seeds that we just popped. So those seedlings are doing good. We had a great um, success rate on the germination actually. Um, had like 60% popped or 70, no 70% popped. But mostly the grapefruit glues came out, the swashbucklers didn't come out as, as great. So there's fewer of those, but we'll see how they go. I am. Um, of course, I have some critical Kush clones and some dark plasma clones and some Smurfzilla clones because those three are going to go through again. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, I have a couple of Malibu pies still in the pile as well, and uh, oh, a couple of blue dreams. But I don't know if those ones are going to go or not because uh, I don't know. It's growing weird. The one that the mom, well, the original plant we had that we cut these clones off of, for some reason started to grow really weird like low like in the sips container instead of coming up and doing this kind of thing she was like doing like big swoopy branches and they were like hanging on the plastic and i really didn't like it and it just looked weird and the middle was staying short and the outsides were getting tall it was so strange so we cut some clones and we killed her and and uh the the new clones we had one that actually rooted, that doesn't root very well. We had one that rooted, it's um, been in the pot for a little while and it was already starting to do it too. So I started to do some, you know, training as far as like cutting away all of this weird inner growth. Like it was wanting to almost monster crop kind of like, so I was cutting all that off of the inner nodes and like I, I kind of topped off the side ones that were getting tall and now it looks like it's evening out and it's maybe it's going to, I don't know. We'll see. I don't know. <laughs> might have to, might have to edit that string. So, um, what, how many times have you guys done the outside grow now? Uh, three times on our own here. Yeah. So are you doing different strains each time or have you found some that Yeah, we have. Critical Kush, we found that we liked. We grew that these last two years. We grew it first year before last and really liked the, the cut. So we kept it around and um, I'm sure we're going to grow that one again next year. We grew a lot of unknown genetics to us, new to us stuff this year. and. Um, it didn't go as well as it did last year, I think, um, partly just because we didn't know the, what the strains were really going to be like or how well they were going to do outside and how long they were going to take, like the snake dogs that never finished. And, yeah, yeah, we're dealing um, with that indoors know. too. So it was kind of like a, well, we put it all out there kind of with a bit of a gamble because we didn't really know know the strains very well. So next year we're going to be a little bit more selective about who gets to go to the outside grow. <laughs> that was the question. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I wondered is, um, so you're going to be selecting certain ones to grow outside then. Yeah. We know the critical Kush does really well out there. So I'm sure we'll do that again. Um, and, uh, from there it's going to be, I don't know, I don't know yet. We've got a few months to plan. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Just heading into winter here, huh? <laughs> Have you guys gotten much snow up there? No, we're getting snow in the high country already. Um, Pedro was hunting up in snow yesterday, so yeah, he he left now. I won't be so distracted. So sorry about that. <laughs> oh no, it's nice that he came home. Did you have to stand for a bit? Yeah, it was good to see his face. It's funny how when you spend like every day with someone and then they leave for just a few days and they come back, it's like you see them again and it's like, oh, your beard is so long. And like you, all of a sudden you see them again like fresh. <laughs> it's funny. 
Yeah, we've we've grown outdoors um, twice, but I think I think it requires um, some refining before we do it again because we need more space. Um, especially if I give them pixie pods and lactobacillus again. <laughs> um, we discovered how to make bean stalks. <laughs> so, um, and not just tall, but, you know, nice bushy plants. So hopefully, hopefully in the next, well, probably not next season, because uh, that'll probably be when we're shaking and moving find in our mountain um, but soon we'll have a, a good scale outdoor grow because I there's something about growing outdoors as opposed to growing indoors that is just it's a wonderful thing being out there in nature with the plant it's definitely a different relationship I mean even with the plants that are growing in pots outdoors, it's different. It's different when they're in the ground, I think. Because I definitely had a, had a different like pull towards my white widow that was in the ground, you know. I, I don't know if it was just, I just liked being near her, you know. I'd sit down over there in the corner of the tent and be like, yeah, okay, I see, so we're chilling. We're just, we're gonna relax and I'm going to just sit here and draw with you, you know, <laughs> like Buddy is sitting <laughs> up behind your shoulder, Dizzy. Yeah, he's like, hey, let me, let me sit in your lap. Would you like to pet me? Would you, would you? <laughs> so funny. I did notice that some of these strains made me sneeze a bunch, but I haven't had any that made me want to sit down and like chill with them yet. But uh, it, it may be well aware that I plan on smoking them, so I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. I like to hang out in the bedroom. I do love the plants. They're just beautiful to look at. It's, it's very common. I think it's really fun watching them grow. Um, just like, has I have to move the lights up, you know, things like that. Like, maybe, oh, <laughs> they're about to touch the light. I have to move it up today, you know, and they're growing so big. <laughs> it just makes me happy. <laughs> yeah, every little, every little thing. It's mm -hmm. funny. Uh, I, I don't like take care of the house plants as well as the. <laughs> me too. I don't, I don't know what that is. But Me too. I, uh, I realized kind of the other day that my ficus was dying. And I was like all droopy and there's like little leaves. Fall. I was like, oh God, I suck. <laughs> I think I, well, you know, um, when when Litty was here, I found out that she does the same thing. So I was like, oh good, it's not just me. You know? <laughs> Join the club, I guess. <laughs> So I had to cut all the uh, all the leaves off my peace plant peace lily the other day. Yeah, oh, but I watered it like probably a couple of days too late. It didn't come back this time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, like, oh, that's not just plain dead this time. It's really dead. <laughs> but then there were these little green things in underneath. So I said, "Oh, okay. It just needs a haircut." <laughs> Oh, a bush. <laughs> Sounds like the air plant I'm trying to grow. My friend um, went to Florida for vacation this fall, and it happened to be when the hurricane went through <laughs> while he was there. And so he brought back like a bunch of air plants because they were all broken off and just like laying in the streets, you know, little bits of branches with air plants growing on them. So he brought some home and he gave one to me and I put it like in this clear vase with some rocks and some water in the bottom, you know, and I was trying to just like dribble water on it every day or every couple of days, you know, see what was going to happen. At first it was going okay, but then we started, we started running the fireplace cause it's so cold. And, um, 
it gets too hot and too dry in that room. And it just kind of went, and I was like, oh God. It's... And so I'm looking at it and I was like, I saw one of the little like flower shoots had still had a green stem on it. So I was like, okay, I'm going to keep giving you water, baby. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe you'll come back to life. It, it becomes a challenge at that point, you know, to bring it back to life. So. Yeah. yeah, totally. I've got like the spritz bottle has like the the sea, seaweed, the kelp meal in there and everything. Like, I'm like hey, can you buy baby food? Some, some minerals and <laughs> feed you, baby. It's definitely a uh, drier climate there than it is in Florida. <laughs> yeah, I have quite the challenge. I was considering putting it in the bedroom because, you know, it's actually hot and humid in there. But yeah. do I really want to take this, like, foreign plant into the bedroom? Probably not. Um, probably not. <laughs> probably not. Who knows? And then something will go wrong and you'll be blamed for it, whether it's you or not. So. Right? You brought mold <laughs> into the room. <laughs> <laughs> that would be funny. But <laughs> so we won't go there. I'll just keep spritzing it every day and we'll see what happens. Hey, I should take it into the shower. Well, yeah, I, I keep, I actually clean out the entire bottom of um, the, the linen closet in my bathroom, and I keep my hibiscus plants in there in the wintertime <laughs> because we have a wood stove, and so like you said, it really dries out the air in the house. The dehumidifier doesn't run. During the winter time, it's plugged in all winter long, but it never turns on because there's no humidity in this air. Like my little my little humidity monitor reads negative. Like it, it you know how the zero breaks. It's like it's like what what is that number? It's like an upside down nine, but it's not a six. <laughs> And it's like, okay, I don't think it's supposed to look like that. And people say it's the batteries, but everything, all the other readouts on it are fine. You're just like, it literally can't read the level of the humidity in here right now. I can't even say that it's low. Okay. It's just it's like, a beast for bottom. <laughs> I stopped trying. <laughs> no hope for humidity in the near future. <laughs> So um, this is why this is why I have a waterfall fish tank in in um, in my bedroom because I need a certain level of humidity to you know main, my, like my skin will start to crack it gets really bad in my house and um, and so so uh, yeah my hibiscus plants I put them in the, in the bottom half of the closet and you know every day I I open the door all the way so they can get the light from the from the window right next to it and you know but I leave I leave them in there because that's the most humid room in the house everybody's taking showers you know every day or every other day so yeah <laughs> I even have a little window thing in the shower so I can put a little vase right there and get sunlight I'm sure your air plant would like that <laughs> as long as it's not too cold that's a long ways from the fireplace <laughs> <laughs> uh, to find just the bright balance in the environment just like in our soil <laughs> man you know I was um, reading about microbes and stuff in all this research and and I you know, it went back to like really the most basic thing for me. It was kind of surprising, I think, because I hadn't thought about it before in that way. But the easiest way to get microbes in your soil is through your compost. Mm -hmm. And when I read that, it was like, well, duh, you know, like I just hadn't thought about it that way. I thought about, you know, it giving food to my plants, but I hadn't really thought about the fact that there's microbes in there, too. And I on all the other good stuff <laughs> that we've been talking about can be in there too, as long as you're using a good high quality compost that's got good inputs um, to to make it, then then you can have healthy soil just with your own, you know, making your own compost. And if you can make your own nematodes to 
boost that population and things like that. I mean, all you can do is uh, make your soil happier and happier. It's pretty neat how they all, uh, you know, create something for the plant and the plant gives them the environment to live in. And so it's like this really symbiotic like relationship where the plant couldn't be as healthy without all these little bugs and microbes and things in there. And those things couldn't survive without the plant either. And so it's like just kind of a beautiful little relationship. It's very cool. Uh, honestly, um, one of the coolest things that I've experienced is making my own soil with a compost pile. You start out with, you know, scraps and the, the soil and, and um, you know, the yard, the yard waste and things, whatever you throw in there. And I uh, keep throwing stuff on top and moving it around a bit and all. And next thing you know, um, um, we had a pile in Ohio that went, um, honestly, we actually went for a year. We moved any of the actual soil and it was the richest, darkest, most beautiful, wonderful smelling soil <laughs> ever. And uh, I, I had just, I just wished, you know, that we had a bigger pile on it. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, it was very cool. Definitely. That gives me hope because we put this huge, huge compost pile out there, you know, because Pedro was like, yeah, I'm going to compost. And he got really like excited, right? So he digs out like this humongous hole with the tractor and we started filling it up with shit and all kinds of stuff. And it has not been stirred. It's been like a year and a half. <laughs> so maybe yeah. in the spring, I, it, get out ours there, not stirring it'll actually be something good. It was. Be cool. it was um, I, I I hate to tell on. Maybe I don't hate to tell on him. Okay, so I just will. <laughs> <laughs> Do it. Yeah. Every time. He's safe with us. <laughs> we won't to defend himself anyway. Uh, now every time I, I try to get a, a a compost pile going here, Mike dumps something in the wrong place. So. I'm still struggling. But there is a pile out there that probably has some pretty good stuff underneath it. So I should go look <laughs> just to see what I've got. The one that he had going with the worms in it had potatoes growing out of it this past summer. So <laughs> it had to be something good going on in there. <laughs> I did see a pumpkin come up in the compost pile it was like way too late in the season but it came up so maybe there's something good going on over there the weeds are sure as fuck happy it also happens to be like right where the uh water drains out like when he was watering our, our cannabis plants outside there's like trenches alongside the trenches and so he'd just turn on the hoses and it all fills down and he'd just run it for hours so that one corner got a lot of water and it's doing stuff. There should be some oh, yeah. things going on over there. I can't wait. Sure. If I just got to get him to dig it up this next summer. <laughs> 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 oh, I have to sneak to stir the compost pile here because, you know, some people think that, you know, leaving the compost pile sitting there for extended periods completely undisturbed is a really good idea. And then they go and they, like some other people, dump something on it that shouldn't be there. <laughs> and it causes things to happen that are really rather bad, you know, and you, then you end up having to move the compost pile and start a new one because uh, that one's been contaminated. Um, so how, how would you contaminate your compost pile just as a good conversation starter? Like what kinds of things don't you want to go in there? Well, you definitely don't want any, any solvents or cleaners or, um, because unfortunately, you know, people don't always think about the runoff on their property, you know, as being something for solvents, cleaners, chemicals, et cetera. But, you know, there's stuff washing off the roads. Um, you know, when you wash your car, you know, and that, and that goes ahead and streams and leaches into the, an area of your backyard, you know, depending on where you live, this can be a problem because it does actually go down and run off culvert 
And if that goes by your compost pile and you're contaminating your compost pile with those solvents, you know, so you want to definitely keep those away from it. You also want to keep, um, well, you want to keep meat out of your compost pile at all costs. And during, you know, yeah. because if, yeah, if, if you put meat in your compost pile, you're, you're going to get uh, maggots, you're going to get mold. You're going to, and it's just going to be a really bad day. You're going to have a really big pile of some very nasty, very poisonous stuff. And it will be poison if you put it on your plants. You won't be able to eat anything that you grow from those plants because you essentially will be poisoning yourself. <laughs> so that would be bad juju. Bad juju. But somebody in chat said that they give everything that they can't give, that they can't um, cook in butter <laughs> to their chickens. Um, and, and that's a great idea. But, you know, also use the chicken poop and definitely, yeah, don't, don't, use, don't use your animals poop, but like your cats or your dogs, you know, because they're eating commercial foods and things and you don't, you know, they're not eating organically. They're not eating 100% vegetatively. They're eating meat. You know, so once again, that is the type of meat that is going into the pile. You don't want to put any bread in the pile either if you can possibly avoid it. Um, because that goes ahead and breeds sugar. And the sugar that it produces is not natural sugars. It's bleached sugar. So you're contaminating your pile in another way. I give a lot of the scraps to the goats and chickens these days. Yeah, my grandma used to do that. I used to love lettuce, uh, the chickens did. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the carrot tops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much any like anything that I have, vegetable or whatever, I'll end up just taking the scraps out there and they eat it right up. Um, yeah. I was going to say too, um, I like to separate the larger, like you can put um, grasses and other yard waste in your compost, but you need to be careful about how much you put in. And I like to separate the larger pieces of stuff until they, cause they after a year or so, they, they break down and you can add them to your pile that way. So I, I like to keep like about three different piles going so that I have one for the branches are always falling off the trees. Got to go pick them up, put them somewhere. And then the leaves, of course. And then you got your grass and stuff that you rake up. So I end up with, with a couple of piles of yard waste and then the actual compost pile itself. Yeah, I have a leaf pile too. Because you know, we have a whole, we have an acre and a half, you know, that we clear leaves from. So um, we live in the middle of the woods. <laughs> so. Um, it, it works out very nicely. You know, our, our pile is fairly deep because we have a nice berm off the back and it grows by like six feet about, you know, every fall. And then every spring, you know, we have an extra like two feet of ground down there. And it's like, oh, yay, look, let's dig that up. Um, but, um, but yeah, no, we also clean out the ch chicken coop twice a year. Um, and... And we put all of that on top of the leaves. We do it once in the springtime, uh, just like maybe three months before planting. So I'd say you know, around March. Yeah, about then because the ground is still frozen. Um, so then as the ground thaws, and it's going to thaw a lot faster underneath, you know, the fresh layer of, of chicken waste that you just spread across it. So, you know, because that's going to heat up and um, and seep down. And so it's going to take the snow, too, and ice and and just, like, saturate all of those leaves and break them down a lot faster. Um, and then we take that. So that's the chicken, the chicken waste and the leaves. And we mix that with our, um, our things that, you know, chickens can't eat. Like, chickens can't eat pineapple peels. 
Okay. People give their chickens, you know, pineapple husks and it's like, you really, you're just, you're creating a rat problem. Okay. <laughs> like you're saying, Hey, uh, weasels, come on, come in here. There's food because it smells, but the chickens can't eat it. Um, same with onions, you know, they, they can't eat onions in any capacity. So it's like, all right, well, you know, they can choke on, on the skins of onions. So, you know, we take, we take things like that, you know, any of our um, herbs or, or stalks or anything from the garden because we take all of our garden stalks and we add that to our compost pile with the vegetative um, stuff that the chickens can eat. And, um, and then we mix all of that vegetative stuff with, you know, the chicken poop and the, and the leaf uh, compost. Lighten it up on eh, Dizzy? Good job. Good job. Go for it. You I fucking it dropped it on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I've had to light this thing like five times now. I just Rosen, relit Rosen, it Rosen. and it was like falling all over. I was getting ash all over the cat and my keyboard and then I dropped the thing on the fucking floor. <laughs> I'm having a hard time with this stupid. And then you get to light again. <laughs> Hold on to it. Sixth time is a charm. Yes. Indeed. <laughs> so, so yeah, you know what I mean? And then um, when we mix it, we mix it up. We put it in, um, in a barrel. And we leave that underneath a gutter so that the rainwater runs straight into it, um, which, you know, pretty much makes it into it kind of soup um you know so we get the the spring rainwater in there which isn't you know copious amount you know you can always cover the barrel um and then we just let that sit until it's time to plant and then when it's time to plant we take the barrel and we go out there with buckets and you know some uh, old pots that we have and we you know just kind of throw it across the garden and it works wonderfully it's it's I mean, it, and it smells sweet too. That's what's weird is it smells like you're like throwing sugar into the garden, like really, really strong sugar, <laughs> like something you would never eat. <laughs> I don't remember having to, um, really don't have, having, remember having to water the, the compost in Ohio, but it rained often enough that you didn't have to do that. But here in Arizona, Definitely have to add water to the pile. Yeah. I don't know um, if it's much different there in New Hampshire. Um, it actually, you know, um, I lived in Florida for a few years back in the um, the late seventies and early eighties, and I thought it was really humid there, which it is, and then. <laughs> Then we moved back to Ohio for a while, and I was surprised to find that it was just as humid, if not more, in Ohio. It's way more humid than I remembered it was when I was growing up. I always notice it now when I'm there, but I don't know if it's more humid there than along the coast of where New Hampshire is, or, or are you, I don't know if you're near the coast, you're in the mountain area, so if it has some effect are you fuck that joint <laughs> fuck it i went out again so <laughs> fuck it <laughs> Boom. are you in an area where it's um really humid or um is it similar to florida ohio ohio pixie Oops, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> it says, hey, we get, we get, <laughs> you know what, Dizzy? You're fucking contagious, like, man. That's like yourself. <laughs> like, I'm fired, man. <laughs> I'm firing what, myself. Fried? What did you say, fired or fried? <laughs> or joints. <laughs> <laughs> don't drop the pipe, okay? Just don't drop the pipe. That would be a travesty. 
Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it gets, it gets really, really humid here. Um, we get like walls of humid humidity and it's, it's almost oppressive, um, especially when tropical storms are going up the coast. So when, um, when it's hurricane season down in Florida, the humidity here is so unbelievable. It's just, oh my gosh, it's like, go away. This is when, you know, I don't call my grandma for, you know, two months because I, I say, you know what? I hate Floridians right now. I really hate them all. I wish that freaking peninsula would like drop off the United States, but then it would be worse. So, you know, and it's like, it's like, I don't hate Floridians. I love the Floridians. My family are Floridians. And it's like, but there's a love hate thing going there, you know, cause when their humidity is coming up here, it's like, no, keep it for real. Just down there. Keep it. I'm, I'm good. I, I know that you want to bless me and you love me and that's great. Okay. I know I was just complaining about the humidity in my grow just a couple of months ago. I get it. All right. But you're late. <laughs> you know? Now the timing is not right. Come on. <laughs> Right? Like your timing is off by like three months, man. <laughs> that ain't daylight savings. <laughs> oh, gosh. It's much easier to smoke this pipe. Speaking of which, I'm glad that daylight savings crap is over with us again for another six months because the like in Arizona, we don't change our clocks. So we have our own time zone. It's called Arizona mountain time, but <laughs> serious guys are so special. I know. Right. Somehow. <laughs> Matt and I were talking about that last night. And we're yeah, I'm not sure if that's like good special or like short bus special or <laughs> Well, we were we were talking about the missing thirteenth month, and you know, it's somebody, oh, some, some, some. some superstitious <laughs> jerk, you know, probably was like, "Oh, we can't have thirteen months." Oh my god! <laughs> oh no! <laughs> you know, and so I, but here's what happens <laughs> every every six months when when everybody else changes their clock. All the time zones shift over. <laughs> so we we end up in Pacific time zone, basically. I mean, it's really Arizona mountain time, but in reality, <laughs> it's Pacific time. Yeah, yeah. So and that's why that's why I get confused when you say when you say, you know, <laughs> when you said Arizona mountain time was missing from my list, I was like there is no Arizona mountain time. <laughs> no, you don't get Arizona mountain time. <laughs> and you were like, and you were like, there damn well is that I'm sitting there. I'm like, well, shoot, nobody sent me the memo. <laughs> so like right now you're in Pacific time or right now you're in mountain time. Right now we're finally on real mountain time. <laughs> so, so you're with me now. Yes, yes. Yay. Two of Yay. us are at the same time, finally. In the same time zone. Yeah, so this is real Eastern time right now. This is real Eastern time. So it gets dark at 4 o'clock here. And it's like... Yeah, that's what freaks me out. It's like, all right, I can I can deal with this, you know, but what... Well, it sucks because it happens so quick, you know, when they... You know, the days are already shortening at a rapid rate. You know, and right. then to top it off, you lose an hour. Okay, so now, now the chickens they stop laying. You know, I mean, you got you got a host of problems. You got a host of problems that are happening in the farm, in the grow. You know, all of a sudden you have to turn on your lights wicked early. It's unbelievable. It's like what the crap? Why? Yeah, all the timers are wrong in my grow room right now because I didn't change any of them yet. So everything yeah. is just like happening an hour earlier to me. I, but I did have to tell my yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I did have to tell my phone uh, that it was now we're, that we're actually in Arizona Mountain Time and not Pacific Time anymore. Because for some Your reason, it can't figure it out. 
the actual clock on the phone does, but the weather app like <laughs> doesn't. So yeah, I, I gotta go. Actually, actually go to the phone settings and change the phone settings for the weather app to keep up with it. It's called <laughs> AccuWeather. <laughs> oh, that makes okay. it better. <laughs> <laughs> accurate <laughs> not <laughs> we get the forecast wrong half the time it'll be like telling me it's sunny and it'll be like totally cloud covered you know or vice versa and I'm like you're right so what is so what the what is what the forecast say because you know? <laughs> I gotta have two apps because it's not yeah. you're always right. <laughs> you should try what the forecast that's a pretty funny app actually yeah, see, I have I have the AccuWeather app, I have the Weather.com app, and then I have my local app. So oh, I have I have the these. Forecast. You'll like it. Well, well because because of the fact, <laughs> because of the fact that I'm gonna make my own app. Okay, it's gonna be like it's like it's gonna be like Pixie's forecast. And it's gonna be like ding. <laughs> I'll use that <laughs> <laughs> because because you know what I do is is I check the AccuWeather and I say all right uh huh uh huh that's what you say and then yeah. I go over here and I and I check the weather dot com and I'm like yeah uh huh okay I got what you said all right writing that one down all right <laughs> local weather what are you saying and and I write it down and then I average the three out. And after yeah, I average the three out, I tell everybody what the forecast is, and it's my forecast. It's, it's not, your forecast it's not any of the apps. Yeah. <laughs> because I'm looking, I'm looking at the weather station, you know, that we have set up outside. You know, we got this digital weather station going and everything. It's up on, it's up on top of the tree. So, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, no, this is Pixie's forecast, and here you are. Okay, it is going to actually be 53 degrees today at the maximum, not the forecasted 67. So right. please bring a jacket. <laughs> also, you might want to bring an umbrella with you because our chance of rain, instead of it being 7%, is more like 40%. So there you go. Take that card, too. All right, wait a minute. I have to have one more for you. We're also expecting a frost this evening. It's going to drop down into the low 20s. They said it's going to reach 39. I, I understand your confusion. That's why I'm giving you cards, <laughs> you know? <laughs> So you have reference, you know. <laughs> I send my dad away at the at, in the morning, and he's like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "It's a forecast." <laughs> That's so funny. I never worry about the weather that much. I I don't know. I get up and I look out the front window, and then I look out the back window, and then I go, "Yay!" <laughs> That's pretty much what I do too. <laughs> my son Mateo. Um, built well he started the weather program actually at his school um, and so he he's fascinated by weather um, he just recently created a tornado uh, in in a controlled little vacuum which was really cool um, so he's figuring out how to how to track wind speeds um, and what he wanted to create was a tornado for his and they actually got him like a vacuum chamber and everything to work with and a little robot to like one of those little um, uh, what are they called the little stem robots that follows the track so he was able to like program where it's supposed to go to take different readings inside of inside of the chamber it's really cool he's super excited about it but he's always talking about the weather um, because as as he puts it the weather the weather affects the air and the bugs in the air and the bugs in the air affect the life on the earth and and I'm like I'm like well there are bugs here and there and he goes no no the bugs everywhere and so I know that he's talking about you know, microscopic. He's he's talking about itty bitty life there. I'm like, okay, well, you know, you want to go ahead and start getting into mycology, botany, you know, biology. You want to, you know, what, what? 
He thinks he's all that in a bag of chips on the weather. He 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 thinks life grows from the weather. The wind brings the weather, you know, and and that dictates in turn what grows. Which he's right, you know. I mean, because if you think about it, you know, the wind carries spores, it carries seeds. This is how you know things get transmitted, you know, and travel from continent to continent. So. It is entirely conceivable that, you know, he just sees it on a much simpler scale than I do. I'm kind of daunted by it, but he loves it. So we, we track weather here. <laughs> That's awesome. It's kind of, it's just like what we do in our grow rooms, isn't it? Only it's just like on this bigger, huger scale, this whole global thing, like the entire global health and the environment and and that's what we try to kind of like mimic a more perfect environment in our little grow rooms with all the light we create wind with the fans and you know and we have all these stuff growing in the soil and we're trying to make this lovely plant to make ourselves feel better i agree totally. yeah. Yeah. it's a wonderful day mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So everybody having a happy Monday because I'm having a happy Monday. It's turned out to be yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was supposed to roll a cone, but I can't roll a cone with unground herb, and I can't grind herb without a grinder, man. Yeah. And you know, I have eight grinders. Mm -hmm. well, that's what your fingernails are for. I just can't find any of them. <laughs> <laughs> but fuck cones. Stick it in a bowl. <laughs> That's it. That's it. You know, Dizzy, you've got it right. Yeah, just you know, just just Yeah. You know, you use the scissors and go for it. Oh, speaking of which, you know, I got my uh diamond cutco uh snips. Those things are nice. But they're nice. they're yeah, fantastic. Yeah, they're very sharp. I hear. I hear they're sharp enough um, to cut you. Ha Yes, they're sharp enough to cut you. So don't um don't even touch the edge of the blade. If you get diamond cutco trimmers or uh, the harvester or the pro, I know from personal experience. I have a scar to prove it on the tip of my finger. I touched the blade. I did not run my finger along the blade, to be clear. I touched the blade because I was like, wow, these are sharp. And, <laughs> and wouldn't you know, that son of a bitch cut me. <laughs> and I didn't even realize it. I didn't even realize it had cut me until like, down and I was doing something else and then Med was like are you bleeding and I'm like no and then I was like yes what <laughs> that's when you know what you happened because it's such a fight yeah, that you don't even hurt cutting me. yeah gotta watch out for those especially <laughs> and you gotta watch out for them you know killer seeds too I mean I've heard of those killer seeds yeah the killer seeds you know, they, they really want to get into the ground. <laughs> I don't know. Apparently, you know, they'll come to your house and beat you up. I don't know. So I, I talked to, I talked to um, Patrick, uh, Patrick King today, uh, the Soil King. How's everything going? Um, Actually, it's going really well, and he and a couple other guys are going to come on our Wake and Bake Wednesday morning and talk about all the stuff they're doing over there and how much uh, they appreciate all the help from everybody in the community and how much more help they still need and what they're actually doing with it all. Um, they have actually have um, a nonprofit organization going on now and they're tracking all the donations and everything that they're doing with the money um so i'm going to be able to actually just have the 
the GoFundMe people have been like sitting on the withdrawals until they were sure where the money was going. And even though I explained that I would be sending it to them, um, and, and at first I didn't know he had, he didn't actually have this, um, he didn't have this uh, nonprofit at first. He just was running it through his business. I wanted to make it easier, I thought, <laughs> by just having, you know, Okay. Women always think we're, we're going to make it easier. Send it to them. No, you know, two weeks, three weeks, they're still waiting. So, so um, anyway, I got a message from them today, uh, a response to my message today about it. So, um, I spoke to both people today. So, all worked out. His his accountant has been gone for a week, but they're coming back tomorrow, and I'll be speaking to the accountant and finding out what. Um, all the details so I can just have it sent right over to them. But they, they're down to about $20,000 right now. They're figuring they're going to need about $100,000 altogether. Spent that much um, helping people. They're helping people with um, shelter, with uh, trans transportation, um, temporary, all whatever whatever help they can give. So, but like I said, he's going to come on the show. Uh, Wednesday and explain all the things that are going on. So um, very cool. Yeah, I'm glad to get, but the, um, the, the GoFundMe account is going to remain open so that they can continue to withdraw the funds. I'll be making sure that people know that about that on Instagram and more of a, you know, where we're on. So that's awesome. So, yeah, that's but yeah, me too. It was really good talking to him and finding out all the really good stuff they're doing. So I can't wait for him to share that with everybody. And he's excited about coming on and talking about it. So um, it should it should be a good show. We'll look We're just going to let him talk. <laughs> Speaking of shows, we won't be doing a uh, whatever show tomorrow night. Just another reminder on that. Pedro's off doing the boom boom hunting thing and... Um, yeah, so taking the night off. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, by the way, was so cool because because I knew that before Med, and I felt kind of special in that moment. And I was like, I was like, wow, because that's my sister, man. <laughs> so <laughs> is travel on plants, man. Are you in is the know? The elk bacon or. Elk bacon. I, I hope he brings home elk bacon. That would be cool. No more elk heart. <laughs> yeah, elk heart. We did eat the elk heart pixie. That was delicious. <laughs> I don't know about that, man. I mean, every time, every single time I get off with the heart, I sit there and I look at it and be respectful to the animal and everything. And I think that's actually what keeps me from doing it because having been raised in the environment that I was raised in, you know, being so super religious and everything, your heart is not just an organ. It is, it is a part of your ethereal being. And so to eat, to eat the soul of another being, I could never, I could never. We always looked at it as it releases the soul. <laughs> but it's also I suppose that has to be really and high tasty and, and, and good <laughs> I, I so think that's why I was made to believe that so that so that everybody else could have it and, and you know I mean they knew what my proclivity would be and <laughs> poisoned me against it <laughs> an elk's heart is really big if you haven't seen one they're like like that like <sighs> It's probably like, I don't know, three or four pounds. I should have weighed it. It was a pretty big one from a big doe that we had a couple of years ago. How do you, how do you fact, cook that? Um, well, I cook it by cutting it thinly and then, um, you know, you kind of cut off any tough areas from the outer part where it's got a lot of fat and stuff and then um, cook it in just butter and put salt on it. That's it. It's so good. I put just the tip, just the tip. We cooked like that. 
the other night and then the rest of the heart went into a big pot of stew that I made for the, the hunters and they're actually eating elk stew while they hunt the elk. Yeah, that sounds good. Actually. Yeah, Wouldn't that kind of be counterproductive? I mean, if the elk smell that, isn't that going to kind of be a little telltale? <laughs> you know? smell it. It just smells like stew now. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I could pick up on that uh, because I've, have you ever like, like I know that moose smells very unique, you know, when you're cooking moose, it's a different smell when you're cooking a moose steak from when you're cooking, you know, a beef steak, a cow steak, you know. Elk is actually, it tastes and smells a lot like beef. Huh. It's not as um, gamey as deer meat. It's, it's, it's more like this. It's really good. Interesting. The most meat smells sure. sweet, kind of like yeah. rabbit meat. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Next time I see some elk in the store, I'll to give it a try. Oh, yeah, do it. I have a bunch of burger I need to make. We really need a bigger grinder, though, because, like, that's what's stopping me from actually making the burger. I've got, like, pounds of meat for burger, and I've got this, like, grinder that's, like, this big, <laughs> you know, so I'm going to take, like, five days of smashing meat for it. <laughs> yes, we didn't ever. My mom had a little grinder like that. I remember her using it a couple of times. We need to get a bigger one. <laughs> Speaking of larger grinders, I have a, um, oh gosh, what is it? Um, uh, I can't even think of it as uh, the KitchenAid, the mixer. With yeah, this, yeah. Still the, okay. I, I have the three, I have a three and a half, three quart, uh, this is a smaller one. Now, right now, it's on sale at Costco, the six quart. Mixer. Yep. With the I was gonna that say. Goes up and down. It's only two forty nine. Oh, I gotta I have it. So I'm gonna have to nice. replace mine and find someone to give it to. <laughs> <laughs> you have a really crappy mixer. Go, girl, go. <laughs> I have the six quart, and and that is that is my baby. That is my pride and joy in my kitchen because it has a meat grinder on it. Um, I have all of the attachments for it, including the pasta maker and uh, oh, the meat grinder, though. Man, that thing, that thing goes through, that thing goes through venison like it's no tomorrow. It was like, okay, yeah, no, it was an eight-point buck, right? Okay, so where's the rest of him? What do you mean it's in the bowls? <laughs> <laughs> Because it was like, it was there and then it wasn't because all they did was cut it in strips and you just fed the strip into the, into the feed and it just went. <laughs> like, <laughs> what happened? See, that's what you need, Dizzy. I do. Holy cow, that would be nice. That is the sad part about the hunting. He's like, he brings home the elk and then I know I have hours of like standing at the kitchen table cutting up an elk to do. <laughs> Because we do all our own processing. It doesn't go to, you know, the shop and get all processed for me. I got to, like, pick all the hair off myself. <laughs> you know? Uh, that was like the year we plucked our own turkeys. That was like, yeah, yeah, we had to shoot them. We had to pluck them. And it was like, all right, I could do without doing this ever again. Like, I, I will never eat turkey again. From that year to this, I have not touched turkey. I just, I can't anymore because it was like, this is a terrible way, <laughs> you know? Like, and there's no way to avoid it. There's no way to avoid it because those feathers, they got to go. <laughs> you can't cook them with the feathers on. Believe me, my brother tried. <laughs> I, I do hate getting the turkey with the, where it still has... The part of the feather stuck in a couple of places. Yeah, yeah, the, the quill is still in there. You have to pull that out. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, when when you get someone who's, um, you know, they didn't they didn't process the bird properly to begin with. Um, 
then you deal with all of the quills and uh, sometimes you'll even find them in the grocery store here because you know we'll get them from the local farms and they'll have somebody you know come in and do the killing for them and you know prep the birds for them so that they can ship them off to the market and it's like all right well it's cool to pay people you know and employ people but if they're not doing a complete job it makes a terrible bird <laughs> But it's a lot of fun. I'll give you that. Um, it, I wish I wish I lived closer so that I could come help and you could show me how because that would be amazing. I'd love to learn something like that. I got some experience <laughs> plucking birds because Pedro took me um, duck hunting and goose hunting a few times. <laughs> it was fun. We had a good time. I, we took my son too. He really enjoyed it and. Uh, yeah, we got to got, got to pluck birds and cook birds for the first time. The first ducks that I cooked, we they weren't very good. It was what was it? I can't remember what breed they were, but they're they're known for being not really great for eating because they taste kind of crappy. But I didn't know that. I just cooked them up anyway, and I was like, "This is kind of gross, honey." <laughs> <laughs> we tried some of the other ones, and they turned out much better. Oh my gosh, my my sister in law. Uh, she decided to try to cook a goose when, when they were living with us for a period of time when they first moved to Colorado. So she cooked this goose in our, in, in my kitchen here. And I don't know what happened or why it was so bad, but my God, it was the worst smelling thing I've ever, ever smelled. I was like, dude, and she goes, I don't, I don't know if, if we can, would you come look at this? And I'm like, dude, I don't even want to try that. I don't want to put that in my mouth. Like it smells so bad. And she's like, yeah, I can't feed this to anyone. <laughs> I don't know what happened to it, but it was disgusting. <laughs> must have been like the oldest goose ever or something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I remember for a couple of years you know, in Ohio when we were doing, uh, we were vegetarian, we did the tofurkey thing, but oh, God. The tofurkey we had to laugh. Oh man, I don't know if I could ever eat that either. <laughs> I'm not a tofu fan. Well, <laughs> up here we have people who go um, turkey hunting with their cars. Because oh, we have turkeys that walk across the road. And unfortunately, they go by, by like large groups. And sometimes half the group stays on one side of the road and a teenager will just wait. And I mean, you see this idiot, you know, three cars back and you know, because he's kind of staring to the left a little bit to see around the corner because he knows that the turkeys come this way every freaking year. And so, you know, guns it, clips one, oh, he missed it, slams on his brakes. It's like, really? It's, it's legal to do here now because, because a, guy, a guy got, a, like, I don't know, a guy got fined or arrested. It was a few years back. And um, for, you know, going ahead and taking a turkey, he ran down with his car home and cooking it up for dinner. Somebody reported him because he was all proud of himself. He was like, he was like, hey, man, I got a turkey today. <laughs> He's like on the way home from the grocery store. <laughs> and, so, wouldn't it be all well, bruised up? Person. Like, <laughs> yeah, the thing is, is they're prolific. You know, in Ohio, we, we ended up with deer a couple of times because, um, my husband happened upon it right after it was killed. And so it was, it was still fresh, you know, but, um, I was a game warden in the area, you know, the game and fish people and they come yep. out and they check it out and love it check it out. And the, yeah, it was roadkill and they let you have it and take it home. And, yep. Yeah. So, no, they do that here, but you're not allowed to target the bird. It was argued that he was targeting the bird and intentionally hunting the bird. And that's what made it so funny. So now it's actually, you know, they had to write a special, like, addendum to the law 
four turkeys. Do they have to tag it? No. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, how is that not the same thing? That, I mean, you're just saying that it's okay. <laughs> like, this is okay to do. Why? Because, and the worst part about it is, is the turkeys are actually extremely tough because they're wild turkeys. They're not like the turkeys that you buy in your grocery store. They're not even like the turkeys that are raised down the road from you at a farm. These are turkeys that are natural. They were, they're just naturally here. They're more like pheasant. But they're a really big pheasant with a really massive skeletal structure in comparison. And the meat is, and the meat is so unbelievably stringy. You can literally peel threads off of it. Okay, it just is. It's like string cheese meat. Ew, that sounds disgusting. <laughs> and this oh is why I, I yeah. hate turkey. Sounds sounds like rat wings. <laughs> I can't handle it. It's the most disgusting meat I've ever tasted in my life. To be very honest, yeah. even the soup, I can't eat it. Well, how did they, gosh, I wonder, I wonder if actually, if turkey was actually part of the, the first Thanksgiving. Or no, I doubt it. Or pleasantly. Probably not. Pleasant they or, probably had venison. You know, venison Fish. for sure. <laughs> they probably yeah. did, but because, you know, people, you know, liked deer. They were like, oh, well, yeah, don't make it a deer dinner because then everybody will go out and hunt deer. That would be bad <laughs> because we want it all. <laughs> it was another greed-based thing. Back to the founding fathers. <laughs> anyway. Boy, we really got off topic, didn't we? We never like <laughs> We really have. I guess we have. Now we're almost out of time. We better take a few more bong rips and. Yeah. Oh, well, I need another ball. <laughs> <laughs> I love this cat. I swear. He's such a sweetie. I keep thinking about Miss Pixie's cat who who must be led to the dinner dish every day. I think that's really funny. Yeah, you know, she only she only meows at my daughter. Like and my daughter will be doing something and she'll be like, What? Hazel, why? What's the matter? And she'll just meow. And it's very out of the ordinary. It's not, it's not her. So of course you follow her and she'll like stop and walk stride for stride with her. And it's like, it, it, you to where yeah, you know, like, like, no, you leave me, keep going, but you stay in front. <laughs> you know? Let's walk it together. Come on. <laughs> And she leads her down the hall, you know, to the dish. And then she looks up, she looks down at the dish and she looks up at my daughter and meow. It's like, why? This Thank little you itty bitty sound. Food. Yeah. And then she starts eating. But the minute you try to walk away, if you haven't acknowledged that she's eating, she meows. Hmm? <laughs> she stops eat? eating. <laughs> <laughs> she stops eating. She knows she has the food, but she just she wants you to pay attention to the fact that she's eating the food. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sometimes my cat wants me to pet her while she's eating too. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> yeah, my other cat. She's still he, pissed off about Bob. <laughs> he freaks she's out bad. when he gets killed. Oh yeah. Freaks. He, he'll come and find me, and he'll actually, the other night, he threw a huge field mouse up against the window, because we have French doors. He threw the thing at the window while I was in the kitchen making dinner. So I hear this ding, and I'm like, what the heck just hit the window? I think a poor bird has died or something. 
I go over and it's the cat and suddenly he throws himself down in front of in front of the mouse and it's like and and I will go to walk away and he comes up to the window and does the double paw you know up and down <laughs> on the window like digging like you will hear me <laughs> That's funny. My cat does the pause on the window thing too, because she's very pushy about the whole in and out thing. She's like 12, 13 years old now. And so she's like, she wants what she wants when she fucking wants it. And she, she'll, she'll go outside. She'll want back in like three minutes later. And I just have sat down with my cup of coffee or whatever. And she sits at the back door and goes, <laughs> with the pads of her feet down the window. And I'll be like, just a minute, you know, <laughs> you can wait a minute. Just, just a minute. I just sat down and she'll do it again. I'm like, Zoe, <laughs> stop it. See, now you're upsetting Buddy, but he's like, but he's like, whoa, that was. <laughs> can you make it up there? Fatty? It's not fatty at all. He's so cute. Is Bob sleeping with the goats? No, he sleeps. On the bed. That's why he's always so mad. Uh. <laughs> that was her <perfect> spot. <laughs> he has claimed it, and she keeps coming down the hall and looking at him, sitting there on her spot. She kisses and walks back down the hall like fuck. She goes and sits on the chair and sleeps there instead. She's so mad. <laughs> She last night thought she was going to be really sly and she came into the room to try to get up on the bed and she thought she was going to jump up like up by my pillow and think thinking she was going to avoid him because she thought he was down by the foot and he was like laying right on my chest so she jumped up like here and he's here and she's like <sighs> she starts kissing at him and just takes off down the hall again like god damn it. <laughs> Yeah, the calico. She's so pissed. <laughs> but Bob is thoughtful, sweet. <laughs> I sure love that cat. He has no sense of space. Mm -hmm. Like I said, he'll lay right in your chest and he wants you to pet him and he's so pushy about it. He'll like push your hand, like, you know, makes you pet him. <laughs> you kind of look like you're hiding from the cat right now. <laughs> I go to go to sleep and I'll like roll over and he comes right back up the other night and he like puts his face literally like right here. His whiskers are like in my face. I'm like, Jesus, cat, can you give me like a little bit of room? Oh, <laughs> Tap breath and oh, oh gosh. I, I wouldn't be able to do that. I, I can't even stand to have covers touching me in certain places. The cat's whiskers would make me crazy. <laughs> yeah. God, you have to back off a little. <laughs> I mean, isn't it funny? It's always the calicos that are that are that way, where they're extremely temperamental about their space, and yeah. you know. But these other cats that are so lovable, like Kazar says that, you know, where he needs to have his people. He will carry his panda bear from one room to the other. It's like it's like the size of him. He's so front heavy when he carries it. He's practically being lifted forward like in those cartoons. That is so cute. You should put a picture of that on Instagram and tag Shadow Panda. He would love that. Oh my God. <laughs> it's, it's the most hilarious thing. I've tried to catch him on video so many times. And and he's just like, but but he's he needs to be noticed. And then, you know, the other, the calico cat comes in and she's like, she's like, oh, I'm just going to try it over here and lay on the floor. <laughs> and she thinks that somehow that's going to prevent him from accessing the entire space, the whole room. <laughs> well, mentally, she's blocking the space. <laughs> See, you got it. Yep. yep. It depends on how big her cat aura is. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. My calico is definitely temperamental. She's never been a very lovey cat. Um, my ex used to call her the psycho kitty when she was little because she was just like, ah! she was hyper and <laughs> all over the place. And yeah, she still is like, she only wants love when she wants it. 
don't pick me up. Fucking don't pick me up. And <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny. She's just a moody little thing. And she doesn't have any upper fangs. They like fell out when she was little. And so it looks really funny when she yawns. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's strange she would have a, a more human like smile yeah it's really funny looking <laughs> I think dog well, smiles anyway I suppose we might as well wrap this up since we're not talking about soil anymore <laughs> it's oh. been two hours <laughs> yeah we are very they're kind of late, but um, but no, the the soil mycology. I'm still looking into it, and I'm I'm doing my experiment, so you guys can be watching for those posts upcoming when when I'm able to complete it and have all the data. That'd be fun. I'm gonna enjoy this. I'm gonna be growing nematodes. I am really excited about that for you. Like, I definitely keep this informed because that that's cool. I I have bought some toads before. And it'd be nice to not buy them. Now I'm kind of wondering how how my kids will deal with it because I want to show them, you know, what it is. I want to see if they have any ideas. Yeah, it's a very cool thing for them to learn about. I wonder what Matt Taylor will do with it. So I'm good if you guys are. This has been a wonderful session. I want to thank everybody for being here, um, especially the chat, everyone showing up right on time. That was very good of all of you. Thank you. There were some early birds in here. It was great. Thank you guys for, for coming and joining us. I, I learned some stuff and I had a good time. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll see you guys uh, next time. It'll be on Ruby Doobie's channel, and uh, that would be November 20th. So, 20th. I'll see you guys then at 7 10 p.m. Everyone have Which a great night. Both of our time zones. Yay. Yes, yes. <laughs> real <laughs> east <laughs> and real mountain. <laughs> right on. Well, peace out, everyone, and we'll see you all next time. Bye. All right. Good night. Okay.